We are at Transplant Center, Hammersmith Hospital, London. She's an honorary professor of renal medicine, Imperial College, London. Her main clinical and educational interests are peritoneal dialysis, dialysis in the elderly, and renal supportive care. She is a principal investigator for feed out frail elderly patient outcomes on dialysis. She has published extensively on peritoneal dialysis and dialysis in the elderly and is the author and editor of several books. She is an honorary fellow of the British Renal Society and of the European Renal Association and is the chair of the Guidelines Committee of the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. Professor Edwina Brown. Well, thank you very much for the kind of words. Thank you, and also many thanks to um, for the invitation to come and speak here. I really enjoyed my time in Pakistan um, and, and uh, learning a lot myself. So this is the preface to the book that um, really got me into the field of renal palliative care, um, the supportive care for the renal patient, which was published in 2004. 15 years ago. And in that preface we wrote that renal replacement treatment with dialysis or transplantation is one of the miracles of modern medicine and I think we can all agree with that. But really, um, the artwork from um, the Whitney Museum in New York, um, it's, it's a giant candle. You can probably just see the light of the, on his head. And um, at the end of the, the blurb that went with this was that at the end of the exhibition this candle would have disappeared as we all will. Fortunately, our lifespan is more than the three months of the exhibition, but we are all going to die. And this is an article that was written a few years ago um, by the Lancet, End of Life Care, the Neglected Core Business of Medicine. We spend a lot of time thinking about the treatment of chest infections, very you know, rare syndromes, but end of life is going to happen for every single one of our patients and people that we look after. And we should really think about how we manage that and make it as high quality as possible. Because that is how we remember our loved ones. So here's a patient's story. It's a 79-year-old African Caribbean man who started on peripheral dialysis in 2010. He went on a cruise, did two trips to visit his family and some kids. I do an annual review with my patients um, you know, obviously once a year, um, and as part of that I get them to think about what would they wish at the end of life, when they're really ill and they can no longer make their own decisions. And what he always said was that if he was terminally ill and had no chance of being independent, he wanted treatment to stop. So after um, two really very good years with PD, uh, he developed severe heart failure, aortic stenosis, required uh, an aortic valve replacement. He never got back to where he was, but he did manage um, another trip to see his family in the Caribbean. Then in January 14, by this point he's about 83 years old, he's admitted with confusion um, and he's becoming demented. He's discharged home doing CAPD, which his wife is now having to do, and support from the palliative care team. A few months later he's admitted because the wife can no longer cope semi-comatose, doesn't recognise the PD nurses. There's a family meeting. The wife does not want to stop dialysis. She wants absolutely everything done um, for, the, for her husband. It's a second marriage. Um, the children belong to the first wife and they were very clear that we must respect dad's wishes. Dialysis was stopped and he had a very peaceful death um, four days later with his family around him. So he had a good quality death. And this story really represents the pathway of end-of-life decision-making from full continued care to withholding treatment. And withholding treatment isn't just dialysis. It's should we be doing that bypass operation? Should we be starting them with chemotherapy for a newly diagnosed cancer, etc.? To actually withdrawing treatment, such as dialysis, um, and then finally end-of-life management. So a good quality of death, good quality death has been defined in a document that came out um, in the UK as characteristics of care during the last days of life, which are important from the patient's perspective, 
are receiving adequate pain and symptom management, avoiding inappropriate prolongation of dying, achieving a sense of control, relieving burden on loved ones, and strengthening relationships with loved ones. So how do we achieve that? It's really with patient-centered and supportive care, with realistic awareness of life on dialysis, predicting the prognosis, recognizing end of life, being able to communicate and plan for the future, and then thinking about the last few days. So one of the things that I am always teaching um, trainees and medical students, and this has been reinforced in the new guideline from that the ISPD is bringing out in terms of prescribing, is that patients do not like being called patients. We should think of them as people and persons. As soon as you talk about a patient, it, you dehumanize somebody. And this is a, a wonderful painting that um, was done um, just, uh, just after the First World War. Um, and in the front, you can see a rather sort of overweight, pleased bureaucrat. Um, and behind him is, is a um, disabled German war veteran. The bureaucrat is meant to be looking after the care um, and improving life of the German war veteran, but clearly he's more interested in his rules, guidelines, and everything else, um, and, and his own life. So supportive care um, is it, during the advanced kidney disease is not just at the end of life. We need to be thinking about um, supporting people to achieve the goals and the life that they want throughout their time with any long-term condition. And obviously, as time goes on and aggressive treatment becomes less and less effective, supportive care becomes more important. And it goes on into bereavement. We need to think about how um, those who are left behind um, are managing and give them support as well. And you heard from Manki Yaku um, in, in his talk um, earlier this morning about um, the, the service of remembrance that they had at the Royal London. Um, and I was really very powerfully impressed by that. So a few years ago, um, there was um, an article about patient-centered vision of care for end-stage renal disease. And we're really talking very much about dialysis, not as a bridging to transplantation, but we're talking about dialysis as a final destination. <laughs> Most of our older patients and many of our younger ones, um, where transplantation isn't common, they're going to be on dialysis and they're going to die. Um, so dialysis is really a palliative treatment during the end of life phase. That doesn't end of life phase is not just the days or the weeks. End of life phase can be years, um, and we really need to think about maximising the quality that time for the patient and their family, or for the person and their family. And the treatment goals for um, dialysis as a final destination are really to um, maximise the holistic support, um, thinking about rehabilitation, thinking about psychospiritual support, not doing unnecessary <coughs> investigations, not doing unnecessary interventions that are going to have limited or potentially even negative impacts on the lifestyle and quality of life of the person you are looking after. So I think you need to be really um, very aware of what life is like on dialysis. It's pretty great. Um, it can be successful. Some people can feel very well. We all have um, people that we look after do, doing that. But when we're talking about multi-morbid, particularly older people, um, and as the data again that Magdi discussed um, earlier on, life isn't like that. And the concept of frailty is really important. So I'm not going to go into huge um, depth about that, but frailty is really the difference between Mrs. A, who's aged 80, who's clearly very fit, who's going swimming, um, and Mrs. B, who is um, at the end of life, requiring a walker, um, looking very emaciated, malnourished, very frail, um, and is definitely going to die fairly soon. And the other important aspect of frailty is the increased vulnerability 
And we need to think about that whenever um, we're thinking about active interventions in, in our um, people that we look after on dialysis. So the green line is when somebody, you know, you or I, um, get uh, a minor illness, we, we, we have a little blip, um, we may not feel so well, we may not be quite so physically active, but we get better very quickly. Somebody who's frail, that's the red line, that doesn't happen. Um, they become more dependent, the period of being unwell is longer, and they don't get back to where they were before. And that has a major impact on the trajectory towards the end of life. So the blue line is people with cancer, so that they have a good, you know, fairly you know, good quality of life, fairly physically active um, until almost the end. The red dotted line is organ failure, like heart failure, respiratory failure, where you have a downward trend with um, blips going down, representing acute events. And frailty is bumping along at the bottom. Um, some good days, some bad days. Um, but really, um, again, um, going down towards the end of life. And frailty is also the predominant association with quality of life measures. So this is a study that um, I led on in the UK, um, comparing people on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis in frail older people. Um, there were about 250 patients um, who were included in that. And um, frailty was the predominant association with all the measures of quality of life um, and not the dialysis modality. Apart from the fact that patients on hemodialysis had a lower treatment satisfaction than those on peritoneal dialysis. So the next step is to think about predicting prognosis and recognising end of life. So this is one of my favourite paintings. Um, it's done by a German Renaissance painter called Kunach, Phantom of Youth. And on the left you see the old decrepit people going into the um, pool and coming out looking young and beautiful. Um, and many, um, and we tend as physicians and healthcare workers to get um, people and their families to think that that's what dialysis is going to achieve. I, I, had, I remember vividly one man in his 70s who when I asked him what's really bothering you, he says I can't walk. He hadn't walked for 10 years and he, because since he's had a major stroke and he thought that going on dialysis he'd start walking again. So we really need to, uh, it, it's sad, it's dreadful that story. And he really suffered towards the end with an ITU stay and everything else. So this is a statement from Hippocrates. The physician who cannot inform his patient what would be the probable issue of his complaint is not qualified to prescribe any rational treatment for his cure. So there are now many ways um, that we can actually try and put figures of, of risk of people starting on dialysis. Something that we as good clinicians should be able to do without having to use computer scores. But people like computer scores. And I think particularly for younger people who don't have quite the same experience, um, they can be very useful. So this is one of the first from the French registry. Um, and, and having any of the conditions on the slide, really um, no surprise that they have a bad prognosis. There's been another method of trying to um, look at prognosis, this is from the States, where they used a surprise question, would you be surprised if this person in front of you was no longer going to be alive? I think in this situation it was six months. Um, and they used various other things as well. Um, and as, as you can see, the more of those risk factors you had, the lower the chance that you were going to be alive in two years' time. And I often use that when I'm talking to people and their families. I may say, if I ask myself the question, would I be surprised if you were no longer with us in a year's time? The answer would be no. And then I immediately qualify that by saying, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily die in the next year. It means there's a chance that you can die. But it does, it does mean that this is an opportunity to think about what treatment do you really want? 
What are you living for? What do you want to achieve? And how do you want your treatment to be when you're at the end of life? You're not going to get better. We want to be able to do what you wish for. So I'm going to really move on to thinking about communication and advanced care planning. So there are many opportunities in renal medicine when we can and should have these discussions. So any older person, multi-morbid person approaching dialysis, we should be having realistic conversations about what dialysis is going to be like, either modality and what their life, likely lifespan is going to be. When transplants fail, um, again, this is another opportunity. When parent, people are on peritoneal dialysis and the patient may not be able to transfer to hemodialysis, either for resource reasons or because they don't want to or they don't have, have potential access. Recurrent vascular access problems in people on hemodialysis who can't have any other options. And really important is when people have other events. So if somebody has had a stroke or a cardiac event, or they've had a fall and a fracture, all of those give us opportunities to have these conversations. So what is advanced care planning? It's a bit of a buzzword in, 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 in this, in real palliative care or palliative care in general. There's nothing complicated about it. It's just discussions, communication, it's not um, with the patient and the family about prognosis and realistic impact of treatment. Thinking about treatment of symptoms, including pain, really important to allow time to answer questions, thinking ahead to get the patient to be able to um, say what their goals are, what their acceptable ceilings of care are and place of care and cultural sensitivity. We all come from different cultures um, so that the discussions can be tuned <coughs> to the needs of the person in front of you and their family. So this is something that I have embedded into my annual review. So I'm talking about how the dialysis is going, what's their chance of getting a transplant, how long should they stay on the ED, should they think of changing to hemo, and then the conversation naturally moves into what would your wishes be if and when, because it's going to happen to all of us, you are really ill and you can't make your own decisions. And I found that about 60% of people, and remember I look after a very multicultural group of people, um, but if we, I think we estimated that once there were about 100 languages spoken in our that real unit. And um, I found that about 60% of people have already thought of this and they're absolutely delighted and thank me at the end of the conversation to say that you are the first person who's ever raised this. Then there's about 20% who haven't thought about it, but are actually very pleased that the subject has been brought up and will go away and come back with, and bring it up again next time I see them. And then there's about 20% who just aren't interested, don't want to talk about it. And obviously the first time, you can't push the envelope, but you can, you have at least dropped the seed and you have given the information about, pro about prognosis and likely events in the future and the limitations of dialysis. So there have been randomised controlled trials. You think that this would be pretty difficult to do, but this is an Australian study which was actually published a few years ago. Um, and they randomised about 300 people to advanced care planning or not, and then um, 56 of the people died within the six month, next six months. So these were all people over the age of 80 who were being um, admitted to medical wards. And they found that the advanced care planning improved end-of-life care, patient and family satisfaction. And these are just some of the um, statements. Um, so these are the um, family members' responses of people who died. Um, so this is the people who had had um, advanced care planning, we had a clear plan, so we just relax and enjoy time like that. You had a very peaceful death. And then those who were in the control group, they wouldn't let her go, they kept doing tests and things she would not have wanted. 
So let's now just focus on the last few days. So lots of things matter in the last few days and affect quality of dying, culture, um, place of death, avoidance of unnecessary treatments, symptom control, diagnosis of the last few days and communication. So my second story, 76 year old man who'd been on peritoneal dialysis for three years, multi-morbid, lived with his daughter um, who did the PD. Um, he was needing more and more help at home and again with his yearly conversations he had always said that he did not want heroic management or a lingering death and he did not want resuscitation. He's then admitted with chronic edema um, and then I discover that he's been transferred to the ITU and I'm doing my dialysis clinic and the daughter is pacing backwards and forwards outside my room absolutely petrified that father is in ITU and could I please go and do something about it. So um, in, in the end what happened was that he, he left the ITU and um, then discovered he was on the cardiology treadmill and somebody was deciding that he was going to have coronary artery bypass grafting. Um, again, he highlighted his previous wishes. Um, he did agree to some stenting just in case it improved his coronary edema, which it didn't, and he then decided to stop dialysis, and he died three days later. So dialysis withdrawal is always a very tricky subject. Um, there was a meeting from Ken Daigo um, in Mexico City um, about five years ago now, um, and it was published in Kidney International. So the conclusion of this meeting was that withdrawal from dialysis is ethically and clinically acceptable after the process of shared decision making. And it's incumbent upon all providers caring for people contemplating to stop dialysis to address it before you make the decision about withdrawal that there's um, remedial factors um, such as depression and symptom control being addressed. So patients with decision-making capacity being fully informed, making voluntary choices, may refuse dialysis and request that dialysis be dissolved and be discontinued. So these are the various situations where um, they consider dialysis and withdrawal was acceptable. But the key statement was that ensuring access to appropriate supportive and or hospice care is an integral part of care following the decision to withdraw dialysis. So does dialysis withdrawal happen everywhere? Obviously not. And this is a study um, that was done um, through um, the European Renal Best Practice Group, which shows among the bottom access is where countries um, which stopped, is where stopping life-prolonging treatment is allowed, um, and the left of the vertical access is the number of people withdrawn from dialysis. This was done by a survey to nephrologists. And as you can see, that in the more, um, the greater number of uh, patients are able to withdraw from dialysis in countries where stopping life prolonging treatment is allowed. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that what I've been talking about, advanced care planning, um, shared decision making is all about patient autonomy and this is very much um, and I'm sure you, you agree with me is very much a concept of medical ethics that exists predominantly in the English speaking world so in North America in the UK some parts of Northern Europe um, and, and Australia but there's the rest of the world very much has as their main principles of ethics, filial piety, beneficence, religious beliefs, and family decision making. So really very different to what I've been talking about. But when we think about that, let's just, you know, we can still use all of those, being able to enable our, the people that we look after to have a good quality of dying. So filial piety, um, which is very common in um, South um, Eastern Asia, um, it can also be turned on its head. So you can say to people, you, you're taking fantastic care of your elderly mother, father, or, or whoever, but they are now dying, and we need to think about 
how they would have wanted that period of life to be. Patient autonomy, I'm impressed. Family decision making, again, is going to be much more common in this part of the world than in the UK and the US. And it is it really, that's one of the questions that I always ask, is who makes the decisions? And these decisions can be made with the family as well as with the individual in front of you. But the strongest problem is, it's not really a problem, is religious belief. So the almighty decides. And that's often a barrier to withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. However, you can still talk to the family about prognosis, about um, suffering, and you know, is this how your loved one would have wanted to spend their last few days? And in my own experience, I find that if you start the conversations early, then the barriers at the end, in terms of going on with what we as physicians regard as unnecessary treatment, are much less. And I don't have a slide of this story, but I was looking after um, a very elderly, dementing um, man who I couldn't communicate with. They were Pakistani in, in origin, and he was on peritoneal dialysis looked after by his daughter, who would never engage in any conversations at all. But twice I tried to have a conversation, and I always told them about the prognosis. He was then admitted under the geriatric team with falls, and I got an email from the geriatric team saying, thank you, know, thank you for all the palliative care conversations that you had. The daughter has accepted these and has taken father home and has agreed that she will manage him at home and further hospital admissions are not indicated. So he, in fact, had a very peaceful end um, at home. So I'm going to really wrap up at this point um, because of time, and I'm going to leave you with, with this picture here, which is Rembrandt's um, Jacob Blessing the Sons of Joseph. A good quality of death is when somebody can die with their family, say their goodbyes, pass things on, and by medicalizing that end of life, we are denying that memory to um, the families and the loved ones left behind. Thank you.